Well, good morning, evening, afternoon, gentlemen around the world. Bill Ragsdale here. Just as a very brief introduction, I was the one of the five founding members of the Ford's Interest Group and its president for the first about five years. And um, was pleased to see it passed on through a series of generations and now exists as the Silicon Valley Ford's Interest Group. But today we're going to discuss a two-dimensional data structure. Uh, sorry, Bill, no, you just disabled uh, your presentation, uh, screen sharing. All right, we're back. So fourth has a variety of data structures. Uh, is the screen live now? Do you see my uh, yes, my we see it. desktop? We see you. Very good, thank you. So we have a variety of data structures, but they exist for the internal operation of fourth. We're familiar with them, but they were all designed to be used in the execution of fourth itself. So when we go into problems, it's the programmer's uh, duty or job or necessity to create the data structures for applications. And there's a few listed there, database, matrices, vector graphics, bid graphics, sound, video, AI structures, simulation structures, and others that you may dream of. So my need in this particular case was I needed a, a general data form for math and statistical analysis. And of course, that is uh, filled by the matrix format. I wanted to be able to load data from CSV files, save the results to CSV files, have an adjustable, selectable data cell size from one byte to eight bytes to accommodate uh, all the variety of number formats we're used to, uh, to include floats and characters just for the present. And I will note that I, I'll note that I have adopted the notation from Scientific Fourth by Dr. Julian Noble. Well, what can my structure do? And of course, this is generally what can a matrix do? Well, I can load it with literal values. I can load random numbers. I can read and write data files. I can do printed formats. I can do math on a matrix by matrix, row, column, subarea, and cell. Then we do manipulation, such as to copy by row, column, a subarea, and by cell, multi-column sorts, and then the linear algebra operations we're all familiar with. And then finally, I can do a limited amount of alphanumeric processing. So we'll start with a simple demonstration. The top line at the left, one, four, create, this left brace x left brace that creates a matrix named x and of course it has one row and four columns the second row in green is a literal uh, load the uh, matrix x is addressed and then the little bracket series there one two three four loads uh row one columns one through four x uh, list shows the contents in green, one, two, three, four. As a, a manipulation, we're going to resize that. So the X44 four, four resize, resizes the one by four into four by four. We transpose it and we list it and we will see the result. So here is that upper matrix in green expanded into a four by four and it's transposed and the existing what were uh, columns one through four is now in row, as in now column one, uh, row one through four, and all the other cells were filled with zeros. So we see we can do a lot of manipulation in a very terse, brief format. So here are the components that go into this system. First, we have to have a data area, and the data area is expressed by the number of rows, by the number of columns, by the cell size. The product is the number of bytes in our data area. Then we need a descriptor to help us process this data size. So first is the cell size itself, which in the case of floats is eight bytes, the number of rows and the number of columns. 
And in addition, we'll see some control pointers. We need to generate a fourth name for each matrix, as you would assume. And we need a number of words to access the matrices, either by single cell, by various rows, columns, or by an entire matrix itself. So here are a few conventions that I've adopted. First is that these matrices are referred to by the address of the first byte in their data area. Common, as you would expect with any sort of a data array and fourth. The descriptors are located by a negative offset from the data area. So once you know the data area, you can do a negative offset over a range of uh, six uh, cells to get these other parameters. By convention, the row and numbers run from one to R minus one. Uh, this is different from normal matrix notation. At the beginning, I tried to, to have a dual noted system where I could switch from zero through R minus one or one to R. Uh, this made life extremely complicated and it made do loops essentially impossible. So I adopted the, uh, the fourth process of numbering the, the rows from a zero to R minus one. Another convention is that I always end a matrix name with the left brace and it's uh, semantically uh, um, convenient when you see where braces are used later on. Uh, the second row from the bottom in rev shows how an operator operates on a full matrix. If you have a left brace and a right brace together, that means you are operating on a full matrix or possibly a, a series of rows and columns within a full matrix. Bottom row, you see X, R1, C1, a double brace negate. The double brace indicates we're operating on a single cell. So in that case, you want to see one row number one column number. Here are the details of the descriptor. First, there's a pointer to the name PFA. We'll see this graphically in just a moment. First, there's a pointer to the name parameter field address. There's a backlink. Uh, these matrices can be resized, and if they are resized, uh, uh, the uh, uh, prior versions are linked together. Uh, this is reentrant, and you can also restore previous resized matrices all done by the backlink. Then there's a pointer to the data area. Then we have the cell sizing. So there is a, uh, the value of the number of bytes per cell. In this case, it's eight for a float. Number of columns and the number of rows. In red, we see three, five, create, and then the X right brace dot descriptors. This is a fourth word to show us what the descriptors are for a given file. And there we see the data location, we see the parameter field address, the backlink, uh, the check address, and again, the matrix size in uh, cell size, columns, and rows. Now here is the core of the data structure uh, for a, a parameter uh, named X. There's a pointer to its parameter field and by the way, as you would expect, these are Bill's does words, create does words. So the parameter field points directly to the data storage area, which again, as we said, would be in this case, five, eight by five by three bytes. Then preceding that are, in my case, six 32-bit uh, integers. The first is the parameter field address pointer. It points back to the parameter field. Notice the parameter field points to the data field and the, uh, this uh, uh, parameter field uh, points back, uh, <laughs> the control structure points back to the parameter field. So it's a doubly linked list. We can traverse forward and backward. The link in this case is zero since the, uh, the uh, matrix has not been resized. The check digit again points to the parameter field address. I'll come back to that in a moment. And then we have eight, five, and three, which are the, uh, the sizes of the data area. The check digit is interesting because it is, serves as a security check or an error check. Whenever you access a parameter field, if you go back four cells, fetch that value, read it and compare, you will know are you in a, a formally constructed matrix, and you aren't just in some random 
uh, part of memory. Very important that every time you access a, uh, a, a uh, matrix that you validated the fact it is a functional correctly formatted matrix. So here's the magic. The word doing the heavy lifting is a double right brace. And the format in which it's used would be to have a matrix name, a row number, a column number, and the double right brace. In this case, it, uh, it computes by the sequence shown there, it computes the initial byte address of, a, of the float cell in the data area. So to access at a byte level, you simply give a matrix name, a row number, a column number, double right brace, and you now have the address of the data area. Uh, at this point, you can then set up uh, do loops or other access mechanisms to scan across the matrix area. The definition for the double right brace is shown there, and it's very simply a, some math analysis all keyed off of the matrix address itself. Here's an example. We'll create a matrix, three rows, four columns, named X. The X integers loads it with integers from 0 to 11, and then X lists, lists it. Notice how the notation is very terse, very direct. We then see the contents of the matrix, uh, three rows, four columns. Then below that, I do the X11, one, one, double right brace, float fetch, float print. And again, we see at the bottom row, expected five. So we reached into a matrix, extracted one cell, and displayed it. Here's some examples of some row-wise arithmetic. Uh, again, we have a matrix, in this case, four rows by three columns. And then each of the lines at the left in blue, the first line is an X17E R hash sign fill. In this case, we go to row one, which is the second row, of course. 7E takes the floating number seven and it fills the row with sevens. The next line down fills the uh, row two, which is the third row with numbers two. Then we do some work. We have the X1, X2, X3, a triple row addition. This goes into the first row, adds it to the second row, places it into the third row. And then finally, uh, X list shows the result. All very direct. In many matrix algebra implementations, this work is done by exhaustive complexity of syntax. They will have braces, brackets, colons, and words woven together to generate access. In this case, every single mode of access, every single function has its own fourth word. So fourth words have replaced the complex syntax of systems such as MATLAB and R. Here's a sampling of the full matrix operators. These operate on the full matrix itself. The first is create, and then we have create star. The create star allows for a variable matrix uh, cell size. So in this case, you specify not only row and column, but also the size of a data cell. We have list for an entire matrix. Sublist will list a portion of a matrix. And then a number of copies, ways to initialize. We can clear, place integers, place random numbers, resize. That's a full matrix manipulation. Then a bunch of internal utilities. Uh, dimensions will actually give us the row and column number and so on. Rows just give us the row number. Uh, cells gives us the number of cells in the storage area. Uh, bytes gives us the number of bytes in the storage area. And these are generally used when we're doing a, a multiple uh, uh, nested do loops. Then finally, some very functional words like determinant, transpose, invert, and bubble sort, which we will see in a moment. So math operators. Here is the full set of math operators. There are 32 provided. Uh, the column wise across is add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And I would point out that the multiply and divide are row wise. There are separate operators for the matrix multiply and matrix divide. Downward, we see the, uh, the, uh, the uh, layouts that are supported by each word. 
First, we can do a matrix operation. We can do it on a common row. We do the operation on independent rows, a common column, independent columns. We can operate on a single cell, common subcell, or independent subcells. And my interesting discovery was that all of these words, every single one of them, roots comes down to a common word, which is the right paren, left brace, sub x, right paren. Uh, that receives the full set of parameters from three inputs, uh, input source, input source, and output with uh, a range of rows and columns expressed for all. So that word was uh, a very aggressive programming with, with several designs and several tries. But once I got it right, all the rest of the other words are simply little simple one-line definitions. Here's an example of alphanumerics. Again, as I said, they're quite limited. Uh, in this case, I am generating a, uh, the 1315 says, make the cell size one, give me three rows, 15 columns. It's created as the name alpha. Then the word alpha fill, uh, fills it with the alphabet starting with capital letter A, and then a character list lists them all. And we see the alphabet there. Uh, this sort of alphanumerics would probably be useful for uh, uh, report formatting and, and uh, headers for reports. So let's look and see how a fourth word is defined in this format. First, we've defined a word of row, uh, three rows of five columns and filled it with numbers one to 14. And we want to transpose that. So we simply say X transpose and we get our result transpose result just as you would expect. Here's the word that does the work, transpose. The first row opens up a resident matrix called transient. Transient is used with a very short lifetime, only within a single word, and it provides a temporary storage. Typically doing math, we'll copy one uh, of the inputs into the transient, um, and uh, this avoids uh, issues when we are doing operations on a matrix itself. Then secondly, we take uh, the X matrix, copy it into transient. The third row is resizing X. This is exchanging the row and column numbers. So X is now resized. Then uh, dimension swap sets up our do loop values. And then finally, the work is done within the green section. We address the transient matrix which is a copy of X, take one cell with the indices of I and J, fetch a byte, fetch a um, floating value. Then over goes back to the original X matrix, we exchange the row index indices and store. We're simply reading from one matrix to another, but in transpose format. So if you are going through this system and you find a, a, a need, a typically a matrix manipulation, you find the nearest word, bring it up, and as we're used to in fourth, take that as a prototype and modify. So here's an example. Uh, this is a, a, a long sequence of manipulations. Again, they're done in a very terse, fourth-like way with very, very clear operators. There's no mystery on, on which row, which column. We don't have a lot of square braces, a lot of colons. Uh, uh, it's very clear. First, we declare a matrix, 16 rows by one column called ref or reference. We fill it full of integers. Uh, ref is filled with uh, a uh, random numbers. 10E says, I want integers from zero to 10. 0E says I want integers, uh, no significant decimals. Random fills that matrix. Generate another matrix. In this case, it's 16 by 2. And we fill it with random numbers from 0 to 100 and with one decimal point. A 1E is, gives us a single decimal point. Now we copy the first matrix into the second with a row copy, with a column copy. We, we take the reference matrix X zero and a C column copy. And finally, we list the composite. So we've built up a little uh, uh, data area for another manipulation. 
The first column is done by integers. The second column is by floats. Now we're going to do a sort. So we take that input. First, we take X and do one bubble. This does a bubble sort on column one. And we do a bubble sort on column two and list. And you see the result on the right. Notice under the first uh, zero area, there are the subsorts that give us the 4.6, 44, 57, 59, 88, and 96 in order, just as we would expect. And then down through the matrix, there's a uh, subsort at the uh, two and a subsort at five, and down to the bottom of N. And we'll look at some performance numbers. Now, some of you will turn your nose up at a bubble sort and say, oh gosh, uh, that's certainly primitive. It is primitive and it's simple to code and it is extremely functional. So in this case, as an example, I'm creating a thousand row matrix with three columns, fill it full of random numbers and do a bubble sort. Now, if I, if I only do it over 100 rows, not a 1000, but 100 rows, it turns out the sort time is 16 milliseconds. If I then go to 1,000 rows, well, my sort time is 1.9 seconds. If I go to 5,000 rows, it's about 32 seconds. And finally, with 10,000 rows, it's uh, just about two minutes. Now, I would point out that 10,000 rows, if I'm doing analysis of daily data, would cover 27 years. So I can do a 27-year span of data sort in about two minutes. Any future work on this, uh, for those that are speed oriented and use a variety of the uh, sorts that are well known. And a bigger challenge would be to rewrite the comparison. Right now the comparison is one line of uh, fourth, but it's about five operations. Uh, actually it's not one line, it's three lines. But it would be to rewrite that as a uh, assembler word. And the second would be the, uh, the row exchange as another word. I would estimate that those changes would make at least an order of magnitude improvement in this. And we would get a, uh, the, the two minute sort down in the range of maybe five seconds or so, just an estimate. So to summarize the benefits of this approach, of course, matrices are great. And this notation is clear, and the uh, fourth implementations are extremely terse. First, it's a flexible data structure. We're able to generate a rich suite of support words, and as you would expect, uh, most of the fourth words are one to two lines long. These words are easily modifiable for other needs. Uh, for example, if you were to go to um, other uh, data formats other than a float, the uh, changes would be quite straightforward. And so if you want to see further information, uh, I've got a postings on GitHub. I would point out that my this presentation and the PowerPoint format is posted on Git, GitHub presently. However, uh, wait 24 hours before you take the matrix uh, implementation that's there. Uh, I've got a little, I have to tidy up just a little bit. Uh, there's a version on there now that's uh, quite stale. So wait a day, and then you'll find the matrix language posted at GitHub. Future work, I currently don't have the SAL support uh, working. Uh, I'm in the process of adding statistics support with all the standard operations we would expect. Some future entry might be uh, expanding the ability for text entries. And with uh, a caution toward number types, Dr. Noble in his book, Scientific Fourth, uh, uses typed numbers, and it makes his code a quite a bit more difficult, quite a bit more involved, because he's supporting about four number types simultaneously uh, in the same matrices. And finally, there are I have some limited report generation choices, and that certainly could be expanded. So to conclude, I'd like to give some credits. And as I always do, I thank Andrew McEwen and Tom Zimmer, who created Win32 Fourth and the European team, member, member, many of whom are present here today, who updated it in the 2000s. And finally, to the late Dr. Julian Noble for his work on scientific fourth. Here are my references. At GitHub, it's simple, Bill Ragsdale, and you'll see fourth projects. 
and you'll see my uh, 90 page manual on 132 fourth and there's a uh, section on all of these uh, matrices. I'd like to thank you for your rapt attention today. Thank you for this presentation and now back to mission control. Well, um, thank you very much, Bill. I'm not sure if Stephen is just muted, but I'll just ask if there's any questions on uh, Twitch. Please ask them now. Uh, are there any questions here? Okay, Andrew Reed, please go ahead. Well, thank, thank you very much, Bill. That was, uh, that was super interesting. Um, I'm not a fourth expert, so my question might sound a bit garbled. But I want to ask about memory. Um, I mean, matrices can consume a lot of memory. I got the impression that these these structures are being created on the heap because I saw the word create. Create usually puts things on the heap. Can you wind it back? Can you throw away a matrix you don't need anymore? How, how do you manage your memory on a smaller device? There are s several dimensions to the answer on that. Number one, heap is not used here. There is a heap structure available in Win 32 fourth, which I cannot comprehend and cannot make use of. And I have been extremely cautious on adding and inventing my own. Second point though, uh, the transient matrix is actually a poor man's heap because I go into upper memory space and grab sufficient amount of space, spaced away from the dictionary, create a transient workspace with the full descriptors that I mentioned and it's a few thousand bytes above here, that's used for manipulation normally within a single word. And during that time, no additions can be made, should be made to the dictionary uh, to avoid a collision. And as I said, normally it's always within one word that does no further creation. However, the transients are re-entrant. So if you have a word using a transient that calls another word using a transient, it will create its own version it will exist as long as that second word is in operation. When that second word ceases execution, completes execution, the uh, prior transient word will be reactivated. So again, there's essentially a linked list of these transient areas. So as I said, that's a poor man's heap. The uh, other use of memory is in resizing. If a matrix is resized, a a clone of it is created or a duplicate is created uh, and added to the dictionary. It is, a, it is another data area created and compiled linked to the first. And so all future references go to the second definition. So here we have a, a linked list of these resized areas. So a single matrix can be resized a number of times. And if you wish to reclaim, you can walk backwards on that linked list and you can reclaim or restore or, re or revert to prior definitions. Normally it wouldn't be done and the memory is sacrificed. There is no reclaim of the dictionary space. Uh, it's just a temporary area that is created, compiled, used, and uh, it exists as long as that word is, it exists from then on. Uh, does that cover? That that was very clear. Thank 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 you very thank much, you. Bill. If I can squeeze a, if I can squeeze a second in, you mentioned that you're thinking about um, new number types. Uh, um, have you thought about putting complex numbers? Perhaps that's not relevant to your implementation. <laughs> and some operators are complex numbers. I'm 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 chuckling because when when there's a smile, there's usually a story coming. No, in my wildest dreams, I had not even yet thought of complex numbers. <laughs> no, no. Sorry for that. <laughs> Uh, but, but I, being an electrical engineer, all of a sudden it has a certain great attractiveness. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm doing mostly financial analysis, and therefore complex numbers rarely come in to uh, the financial community. <laughs> but in the scientific community, it's a, it's a core element. Just wasted a month of your life. I, you won't be able to let those complex numbers go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Right. The uh, structure, though, 
is so easy to, cre to create an add in the data area, it would be trivial to expand each cell to have two floating point numbers, uh, real and imaginary. So uh, you, you could go to a, 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 instead of an eight byte cell, go to a 16 byte cell, and it, I, would, I would view it as uh, uh, directly solvable, directly implementable. Bill, you you mention you mention using a floating point. Um, how often do you find the pre the precision gets in the way? In Win thirty two fourth is not an issue because they have uh, nineteen digits of significance, so I have no needs to go. And they they have between sixteen and nineteen digits of significance, so not a problem. Also, Win32 Fourth does allow for double precision floating point. My goodness, I think it's uh, what are they, 64-bit words? But uh, I have again no need for single precision. This this uh, Win32 Fourth goes to the full precision of the um, floating point uh, support in the Intel chips. Okay, I, I would I know I know several people in the civil engineering community. Who would disagree with you rather violently? <laughs> what well, is that mean that that the Intel chip isn't accurate to sixteen decimals, or sixteen decimals isn't enough? Isn't enough. Well, then Win thirty two fourth has has double precision floating point. So yeah, but in that case, yeah, I'm talking sixty four bit is not enough. Eighty yeah. bit is not enough in places. Yeah. Well, then we bump into the. Uh, limit of the processor itself it sounds like no you do the you do the traditional fourth thing which is to go back to integers and have 128 bit integers oh. <laughs> i'm sm again smiling that's beyond the resolution of the financial community uh even if we're computing in yens uh uh 16 decimals is sufficient. I'm it's, not sure what the national, the, the national budget of Japan in yens, I'm not sure how that number would be. You, you've hit this problem with big civil engineering projects that are done in multi, multiple currencies where you have to preserve, effectively it's the number of guard digits at the, bo at the bottom end uh, that, that causes the grief. But Stephen, you always, wherever you see a civil engineering project, you always see a small pile of bricks left over at the end. Or a large pile. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> well, I think Anton has had his hand up for quite some while, Mr. Chair, and so, oh, so, so did I, Anton. so... Okay, Anton, go ahead. Um, yeah, so uh, builders, um, the Fortran people had... Uh, data structure called the dope vector, which is basically the start of, so for, for representing one dimensional arrays, which is the start of the um, array, the um, a number of elements, and that's the important thing, uh, where, where the, the offset to the next element. And this allows um, to um, represent rows where you have then the next element is just a few bytes away and columns or, or if it, yeah columns where the the stride is uh, somewhat larger and you can also represent diagonals and I think if you make use of that you can probably um, have a uh, refactor your uh, word set to, to have fewer words yeah interesting very good there over time uh, software such as matlab has had expansion after expansion and apparently they're transparent uh, they've added symbolic notation uh, they've added um, uh, uh, intermixing of, of text and numbers intermixing of formats and so i'm sure that the internal structure of their matrices has become uh, 
let's shall we say elaborate, uh, more detailed, more functional. And in my case, I'm just I'm just rows and columns, and I want to get I want to get uh, to the statistical analysis as quickly as possible. I also so had a sorry. Okay, I mean, when you say as quickly as possible, what is what is your what's your unit of 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 time? I'm I'm scratching my head to see if I should have a witty answer or a direct answer here, <laughs> but uh, the. The less often I have to go into the art of computer science with Donald Knuth, uh, the more efficient my time is. Okay. So I must, okay. I must admit, when I got back to sorts, I went back and pulled the book out for a, a quick review. I hadn't opened the book in about 10 years, but I'm not pushing back the frontiers of, com of computation. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, I'm like a mechanic who's out in the garage building a sports car that he wants to drive around town and show off to his friends. Um, yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else with their hand up? Sorry. Yes. I don't see Just look hand. at big blue button. You can see that my hand is up still. If I might be so bold to say that. <laughs> yeah, but I don't have any privileges to see these things. Okay, well, then I'll just... Can I ask the question, Mr. Chair? Yes, of course you may. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Bill, thank you very much for the talk. I should also thank you from Ricky Ricardo from uh, Twitch. He says thanks for the nice talk. And I wanted to ask... Um, have you ever considered um, to, to extend it, your matrix multipl multiplications and primitives to allow for 3D rendering? Because normally the matrices are computed on the CPU and then passed onto the GPU. So did you ever use that or uh, are you not interested in that? Uh, uh, now that is... Um, if I'm on generation one, I assume that's about generation four for me. So uh, it will be a while. But would you accept uh, contributions to your repository, which uh, covers that? Just so we know. Oh, absolutely. Oh, oh yes. Um, I, I drew originally on the work of Dr. Noble. Mm -hmm. uh, and his entire book is posted on GitHub in PDF form. But um, I found there were two flaws in his work. One was that using type numbers, it became tracking what number was doing what job became pretty involved. And secondly, he was using a memory management methodology from the 1980s. And in his code, memory management kind of gets in the way. So I would be much more open to anything that's contemporary. So I would. Uh, I would love contemporary resources, so thank you. Any more questions? Anything from uh, Gerald? Can you check if there's anything from Twitch? No, there is nothing new. Okay, uh, Bill, are you, are you? If you're done, then thank you very much for an entertaining talk. Thank you. Pleasure to be here, gentlemen. Thank you so much.